So decentralized finance is a new technology, is quite disruptive, and fundamentally, it's about putting peers together. So instead of dealing with the middle person or institution, like a bank or an exchange or a broker, you deal directly with a peer via an algorithm. And let me give you a simple example of decentralized exchange or DEX. So I've got asset A and I want to use that to buy asset B. So there exists a decentralized exchange. It's an algorithm. Anybody can see the code behind it. Anybody can see the liquidity that's involved in the exchange. And at any time during the day, any day of the year, I can send my asset A to that DEX or decentralized exchange and receive asset B. I see the price that I'm going to get. So this is something that is extremely disruptive for trading. Uh, when you actually do this, your execution and settlement happen at the same time. So in today's trading, it's two day delay. So this idea of trading with an algorithm, that's not far-fetched at all. So we talk about this in DeFi, but it's not far-fetched to think in the future that we will be interacting with algorithms in many different applications. But there's a lot of low-hanging fruit uh, to do this within decentralized finance. Of course, DeFi is much broader. So I give a trading example, but it could be transferring of funds. Uh, it could be lending, borrowing, insurance. Uh, it covers almost every aspect of finance. So the regulators have a very difficult task. So number one, if they don't do anything, then it's the Wild West and people will be taken advantage of. Indeed, in the US, the main legislation, the Securities Act of 1933, was designed to prevent the problems that happened in the 1920s before the Great Depression, to protect the investors. Now, if you go to the other side, where you've got extreme regulation that's very harsh, then your best ideas will just move offshore. This is a global technology. It's not a technology for any particular country. So no country wants to lose its best ideas. So the regulators need to find the middle ground and it's challenging on multiple dimensions. So one dimension is that this is a complex technology. So you need to invest time to understand what's going on. And then even after you do that, uh, it's changing so rapidly that you have to continue to invest in understanding this technology. And it's also hard, hard to hire people that are knowledgeable in the space because they are in demand uh, in terms of you know, other opportunities. So, so right now we're in kind of an unfortunate spot where we don't have the regulations and some very good ideas are locating like offshore. So I think you want to avoid that. Mm. So there's another complexity here, and that is that uh, within this space, there are centralized companies working and dealing with decentralized finance. And I'll give an example, for example, uh, Coinbase. Okay. So that's a centralized exchange, it's a company. It's got a CEO, board of directors, headquarters. Uh, it's easier to serve notice of legal proceedings to a company than an algorithm. Mm. So for example, a decentralized exchange is just an algorithm. How do you serve an algorithm? Notice that the, they're violating some regulation. So again, this is a complex space. Uh, we do need some regulatory guidance and I hope that the regulators take their time to do this right. Don't rush it. And in the meantime, they should grant what's known as safe harbor. So if you've got a new idea, 
and you put it out, but later they determine it's a security, then you're not going to be prosecuted. That's just mm -hmm. not fair because you didn't know uh, and there was no effective guidance. So in my opinion, the central bank digital currency initiatives or CBDCs are a reaction mm -hmm. to what was happening in the crypto world. So these cryptos are competition to the fiat uh, currencies. So think of them as a different way of transacting value. So traditionally, uh, the fiat currencies have had a monopoly within a country. In the world of decentralized finance, you've got a choice as to how to pay. So you could pay with fiat currency, you could pay with a digital token that's linked to the fiat currency, but you can also pay with a token that's linked to gold or silver or a stock or some land. So everything is tokenized in the future in DeFi, and that means there's intense competition. In my opinion, the central banks have already lost control of money. And uh, this technology basically provides this competition, and it basically also ensures that the central banks don't go offside. And let me give you an example. Venezuela, a country with hyperinflation. If you're in Venezuela and you are rich, you are hedged because you have a bank account in Miami in US dollars. So the inflation is annoying. And traditionally, it's been the case that the average person in Venezuela is hammered by that inflation. But now it's different. The average person in Venezuela has got a mobile phone. In the mobile phone, they have a digital token that's linked to the US dollar. That's their bank account. So the average person is dollarized, the rich are dollarized, and the central bank and government basically are disintermediated. So Venezuela is an extreme example, but we see this happening in other countries like Turkey. With their uh, very high inflation, people are hedging by using digital uh, currency. So I think that this is a competition. The central banks have reacted. Um, China in particular is a leader here, and I understand why. So if you're in China, one of your prime objectives is to hedge. And if you've got money, you want to get it out of China. And the current rules are $50,000 a year. But those in China realize that, well, we don't need to transfer $50,000 a year. We could just buy some cryptocurrency. And that exists on a ledger that is populated all over the world. So you can just show up in whatever country and access those funds in a ledger. So they had to do something harsh. So they banned crypto. And they also are introducing a CBDC. So there are some downsides to the CBDC. The government can see every transaction. The government can arbitrarily edit your account. They can take your funds. So that sort of technology is not going to fly in the US and is not gonna fly in Europe in that sort of form. So the citizens, and this is a, like a bipartisan issue, uh, are just not going to allow that. So we will have CBDC in, you know, on the side um, with regular fiat currency, and there will be competition from the regular cryptos. So will CBDC take over? No, extremely unlikely. But we do need some sort of uh, advanced payment mechanisms that are really woefully lacking in our economies. And CBDC will be there in competition with other uh, methods. So we are very early in this space. And it is kind of interesting already that if you look at the total value of the cryptos, it's approaching the value of all of the US currency, like the notes and bills. So even though we're really early, uh, it's actually still something that needs to be reckoned with. But in my opinion, we're about 1% in 
into this uh, disruption. And right now, to actually transact in the space is not easy. So you need a special wallet, and not everybody's got that. You need some capability. Uh, and in the future, it's just going to get easier and easier to actually do this. So it'll be, you go to the grocery store, you open your, your phone, and then you decide how to pay. So will you pay with the local currency? Will you use a credit card or debit card? Or will you choose some of your other assets? And maybe you choose gold. And maybe uh, the grocery store doesn't want the gold, they want something else. And it's all seamless that the gold is transferred into what the grocery store wants you know, instantly with the decentralized exchange at the best possible exchange rate. And the person, all you do is tap. You select what you want to pay in and tap and you're done. So for transactions, that's very important. But we'll see other things moving over. So all stocks, all bonds will be tokenized. We will not have a situation where we've got monopoly power for the exchanges. Like right now, you decide what exchange to list your stock on. In decentralized finance, there are hundreds of exchanges and you don't decide. The, the, the person that sets up the liquidity pool basically does it and you've got competition. So that will be completely different. The banks will look much different than they look uh, today uh, for those of, um, that actually make it through this disruption. So we're 1% uh, into this. There's a long way to go, and I think it can happen quickly. So this is not like a 25-year forecast, but if we were able to look ahead 10 years, the financial system will not look the same. It will be fundamentally altered.